Hi everyone, thanks for joining today's seminar series organized by the Empathic Computing Laboratory, the first of this year actually, so welcome. Um, I'm your host, Pai, and our guest speaker for today is Jamie Lian, who is currently the lead radar research engineer of Project Soli and Google ATAP. So she leads a technical team developing novel radar sensing um, techniques and systems for human perception and interaction. The title of her talk is Soli, Millimeter Wave Radar for Touchless Interactions. Um, which is about Soli's development and productization path from the concept all the way to the core RD and finally the integration into the Pixel 4 phone. Um, so without further ado, over to you, Jamie. Thank you, Pai. Um, thank you everybody for having me. It's really a great pleasure to be here. Um, and I especially wanted to thank the people that we've been collaborating with from the CL. Uh, I think it's been a really productive and enjoyable collaboration. Um, I'll start up the presentation here. Okay, so my talk today is on Project Soli, which focuses on millimeter wave radar for touchless interactions. Um, I'll start with a broad overview of where we are now. The Google Pixel 4 actually launched in October 2019, and it had the first ever radar in the consumer phone. So this was a really big deal, not just from an interaction and human machine interface perspective, but also that radar as a technology could be viable for human machine interaction. And it wasn't just a defense or industrial or vehicle application based technology. And of course, from the HCI perspective, it introduced a brand new class of um, interfaces for touchless gestures and interfaces. Um, so in this talk, I'll cover uh, Project Soli's journey um, about how we built from the ground up this radar technology, uh, all the way from the R&D concept to the integration into this global consumer product, the Pixel 4. So Project Soli actually started back in 2014. The original motivation was to capture the extreme precision and dexterity of the human hand. And we know that the human hand is capable of very sensitive motions because we use these to interact with fine tools and perform very delicate physical manipulations like you see here. So the original idea of Project Soli was to capture and leverage this dexterity in order to build brand new uh, intuitive and ubiquitous user interfaces. And the reason why we felt that these interfaces were necessary is because there were new classes of consumer devices coming out. And these devices included things like wearables where this uh, touch screen size was becoming smaller and smaller, which means that it becomes more and more cumbersome to interact with them through touch. As well as IoT devices like you see here, um, where often you don't want to put physical input controls there due to space constraints or aesthetic design. So when we're thinking about building a brand new class of sensors, there were a number of desirable qualities that we wanted to achieve. Um, firstly, we wanted to be able to capture motions in 3D space, of course, but across a range of scales, all the way from sub millimeter, so we could do uh, different types of gesture interactions to room and house scale, so we could do um, human presence sensing and activity recognition. Uh, we wanted our sensor to be able to operate any time of day um, in a variety of environments, so it had to be immune to external lighting conditions, temperature, um, as much as possible to weather, things like that. Uh, we wanted the sensor to be able to be always on. So we wanted it to run continuously, which means that anytime the user wants to in initiate an interaction, it would be ready. Um, it wouldn't require a lot of cognitive effort to get it started, and it wouldn't require any complex hand-eye coordination. Um, and then another feature that I think is becoming more and more relevant and more and more important these days is privacy. So we didn't want to have a sensor that would capture recognizable visual images like a camera. We wanted something that would preserve in some way a user's privacy, especially because devices these days are being put in places like bedrooms and workplaces, um, often where the user doesn't want to be seen or heard explicitly. Uh, we wanted the sensor to be able to be embedded behind surfaces, which means that it wouldn't impact the product's physical design or industrial design. And finally, of course, it had to achieve a feasible size and power to actually go into consumer devices. So when we looked across the spectrum of existing um, human interaction sensors that existed at the time, uh, the two primary ones were capacitive touch and cameras. And these two classes of sensors could fulfill some, but not all of these requirements that I just explained. However, there was space in the electromagnetic spectrum that could support all of these properties, and that's radio frequency or RF. 
So when we started the project in 2014, we saw that there was a very wide open space for a new class of sensors for ubiquitous human sensing and interaction. And those were namely radars. So our project, um, our goal was to build a full radar system for consumer interaction from the ground up, completely rethinking all of the systems engineering and design that had previously been done, been done for radars. Um, and as a radar system, this is a truly multidisciplinary effort. It covers everything from hardware architectures to signal processing, the software abstractions, uh, the user experience paradigms, gesture recognition, embedded hardware, all the way to how you actually integrate it into a product. So in this talk, I'll touch upon each of these different areas to explain how they all came together and were finally embedded into the Pixel 4 smartphone. So to set the stage a little bit first, um, I'll cover a little bit of background and history to provide some context about radar. So radar is actually, it started as an acronym standing for radio detection and ranging. And it's a pretty simple um, concept. The main components are that you have a transmitter and receiver. Uh, you have antenna, um, either one connected to both of them or one for each. The transmitter and the receiver have some sort of synchronization or shared clock and timing. Um, the transmitter transmits some sort of modulated signal. And this radio frequency wave, EM, at, um, at the 30 hertz to 300 gigahertz EM spectrum, uh, then propagates through the medium, which oftentimes is air, but can be other types of materials as well. And when it encounters a, different, a change in material or an object, uh, the wave scatters. So some portion of that wave may be returned towards the radar receiver, but some of it can go elsewhere. Um, so the radar receiver intercepts this reflected energy, some portion of it, and then processes the receive signal in order to derive some sort of information about the object that caused the scattering. So radar has actually existed for quite some time. Um, the earliest experiments which showed that radio waves could be used for detection actually happened way back in the late 1800s or early 1900s. So this actually shows the first concept of radar called the telemobiloscope developed by a German named Christian Hosmeyer back in 1904. And his idea was to use radio waves for detecting ships and fog. So already um, exploiting this property that radio waves would be immune to um, optical occlusions like fog or different types of weather. The first concept of modern radar actually came about around the 1930s leading up to World War II. And it was developed actually concurrently across many different countries, uh, many of them fighting against each other. Uh, but in England was used as a technology for detecting aircraft. So this is a picture of the chain home radar, which was used for aircraft detection in England around 1938. So you can see how massive this technology started out as. So fast forward to uh, 2014, immediately our first question was, how do we actually shrink this radar technology down to make it feasible for wearables and everyday devices? So something that was on the order of tens of meters tall and required multiple huge towers, how do we actually make it fit into a smartwatch or a wearable? So there are a couple obvious requirements for radar in a consumer device. First, that it has small enough form factor. And secondly, that it can actually achieve sufficiently low power to be embedded into a consumer device. And when we started the project, there was no radar commercially available that would meet all of these requirements. So we had to build our own prototypes. Um, this picture shows some of the ones that we iterated through early in the project. And we went through several hardware implementations to try to um, come across the best hardware implementation and refine it from there. Uh, this is one of our earliest sensor prototypes. It's actually a five gigahertz ultra wideband impulse radar. So at this frequency, the biggest limitation was the size of the antennas, which are a function of the wavelength. So even though this was a small form factor, it wasn't quite small enough to embed into a wearable. So in order to support our vision of truly wearable and ubiquitous radar, we had to move to higher frequencies. And this is when we made the switch to millimeter wave RF, um, where there was an unlicensed spectrum at 60 gigahertz. The transition to millimeter wave radar is actually not trivial. 
Um, our very first 60 gigahertz prototype is shown here, which we built from discrete off-the-shelf components. Uh, you can see it was about the size of a desktop, so not quite wearable. Um, it consumed over 30 watts of power, and we actually had to use multiple cooling fans to keep it operational. And over the course of about 10 months, we shrunk the technology that was in that prototype down to a single RFIC implementation. So you can see here, we actually developed multiple 60 gigahertz radar chips, which were based on different modulations and different hardware architectures. Um, what they had in common is that all of them provided a complete solution on a chip, which included the receiver and transmitter antenna arrays on package. And this meant that they could be manufactured at scale and that they were very easily integrated into different devices without needing very specialized high frequency RF engineering or antenna design. So immediately this made the technology more accessible to a new class of consumer devices. Um, this is an overview of one of those early chips. Uh, it's a frequency modulated continuous wave radar using a silicon germanium process. Um, and I'll just briefly mention that our current iteration of this architecture includes the full RF front end, the intermediate frequency conversion, ADCs, and PLL on chip. Uh, the, early, the other early chip that we developed was actually a um, CMOS direct sequence spread spectrum radar using binary phase shift keying, so an entirely different modulation scheme. And it was actually built using um, a communications chip backend so we leveraged an old Vikic chip and we architected it for radar. And here the pulse compression for the radar processing was actually performed on the chip in the baseband component. So a lot of the effort, once those RFICs were um, first designed, went into optimizing the chips for power consumption and size. This gives a brief overview of the um, roadmap that we followed in order to shrink the footprint of the FMCW chip. So in order to get from our first chip on the very left to the current chip, which is so shown right next to the US quarter, um, we had to do things like completely redesign the antenna array. We went from a two transmit and four receive arrays on chip down to one transmit and three receives. Um, we also had to explore new packaging technology so that the antennas sit underneath the die. Um, and this we did with a laminate packaging, which is shown in that final chip. And the final chip is actually a mere 6.5 by 5 millimeters in size, so it fits easily into different devices which have very tight space constraints. Um, a lot of the effort also went into optimizing the chips for power consumption. And actually, over the course of the project, we've been able to reduce the FMCW radar power consumption by over 300 uh, 300x. Um, we've done this by moving from silicon germanium to by CMOS. We integrated various hardware components into the chip. Um, our latest iteration of the chip has new power efficient management schemes. And we also spent a lot of time in optimizing the duty cycles of the radars for different sensing use cases, which help drive down the power consumption. So all of these hardware engineering efforts made it physically possible for the first time to embed a fully functioning radar into a phone. You can see here where the Sully chip lies um, and how it looks in relation to the phone uh, for the uh, prototype of the Pixel 4. Of course, meeting these constraints on the radar form factor and the power have very important implications on how we do the sensing. And so in our project, we designed the radar sensing pipeline specifically for the constraints of these consumer radar systems. What this means is that we had to rethink some of the very traditional and classical approaches for radar sensing. And these traditional approaches are based on sensing very uh, rigid targets, which are spatially resolved, which means they can sense only a single target, a single scattering point within each spatial resolution cell. You can think of a classical speed gun where there is a single ball going towards the gun or um, a speed gun that people use for cars and you point it directly at the one that you want to measure the velocity of. So you can use these principles for tracking very coarse um, translational body or limb movement, but for the fine gesture sensing that we wanted to achieve, it required tracking very elastic and deforming hand poses. And that means that there are multiple points that move with extremely complex dynamics very, very close to each other. 
So if we had followed a classical radar approach, we would require an extremely, uh, an extremely high spatial resolution, which would be needed to resolve the various parts of the hand. And for a millimeter scale finger poses, that would require over 100 gigahertz of bandwidth. Um, it would require an antenna aperture over a meter long, which obviously is infeasible for consumer applications. And there you're subject to FCC constraints. These are spectrum regulatory constraints, as well as the form factor needed to embed into consumer devices. So taking those into, uh, um, into account, the best spatial resolution we can achieve is on the order of centimeters. So two course to do um, very fine millimeter scale gesture sensing with that approach. So the way that we worked um, with these constraints in mind is that we forgot entirely about trying to spatially resolve different parts of the hand and we took an opposite approach. So first we model the hand as a collection of dynamic scattering centers. Um, and each one of these scattering centers we parameterize by their reflectivity and their position, which is changing over time. The reflectivity um, parameter captures a lot of different physical characteristics of the scattering centers, such as the shape, the size, the surface roughness and material, um, this orientation relative to the radar, as well as some radar parameters like the transmit frequency and the polarization. And then the receive signal then is a time varying function of these target parameters. So the way that we operate the radar is to illuminate the entire hand with a very broad antenna beam. This is opposite of a classical approach where you would try to make the antenna beam as narrow as possible and scan it over the, the target to try to resolve different parts. So we use one broad beam to illuminate the entire hand. We transmit a periodic modulated waveform at a very high repetition frequency. It's called the pulse repetition frequency or PRF. So when we do so, the received signal is a complex superposition of reflections from all of the scattering centers that I previously mentioned. And as these scattering centers on the hand move, um, the received signal changes from pulse to pulse. So you can see an illustration of how the signal's very fine temporal variations can then be processed in order to resolve different dynamics of these scattering centers, and then to interpret those dynamic, uh, dynamics as gestures. Um, so the received signal then is a both space and time varying function of the scattering center characteristics and the radar parameters. Specifically, the amplitude of the received reflections are dependent on the scattering center reflectivities that I mentioned before. And the phase and the time delay of the received reflections are dependent on the scattering center distance from the radar, as well as their displacement from one pulse to the other. So the, the key to the processing chain, um, the signal processing and sensing paradigm that we implemented is to process the received signal in order to resolve the different reflections from their superposition. And in order to do so, we process this raw received signal as a function of multiple dimensions. The fast time, so within each chirp, the slow time, so from one chirp to the next, and then channels from one receiver to the next. And um, from these different dimensions, we hope to extract, be able to tell that one uh, reflection comes from a certain scattering center while another reflection comes from another. So for each pulse, we perform a modulation specific pre-processing, which resolves spatially the point target response. And this produces a low resolution range profile of the target. So we have a mapping of how much reflected energy appears as a function of how far away from the radar the scattering center is. We also investigated a new type of transformation um, of fast time spectrogram, which visualizes frequency dependent electromagnetic responses of the target. And then we combine across the different transmit receive channels in order to obtain some coarse angular information. So, um, the direction of arrival of the different reflections. We then augment the spatial transformations with the slow time processing of pulse to pulse signal variations. And this allows us to resolve the different hand and finger components that move with different motion patterns. For example, with Doppler processing for velocity resolution, which means that we can start to resolve different points on the hand that are moving with different speeds and in different directions. <clears throat> 
So this processing exploits the phase sensitivity of millimeter, mill, excuse me, millimeter wave radar um, to detect extremely fine displacements over time. And with our wavelength of five millimeters, that means that we can detect fractions of a millimeter. We're sensitive to fractions of a millimeter of displacement from one chirp to the next. So this combination of spatial temporal processing produces some time varying representations of the target reflections. And within these uh, representations, the individual scattering centers are resolved according to their position and their velocity or motion. And the motion resolution is the true key here um, because it's built upon the radar's phase sensitivity. So it's in, the radar is inherently, um, an inherent strength is to uh, be sensitive to these types of displacements. And it's the key enabling paradigm for the Sully processing pipeline. Um, the signal representation that we get from this processing produces a high dimensional range velocity angle data cube, but we can additionally compute lower dimensional projections of the signal transformation, which are shown here. And together, all of these transforms provide a very rich visualization uh, of the hands dynamics over the course of the gesture. So this processing, in summary, transforms the original raw radar signal into representations of the hand pose and dynamics, which allow the gesture to be discriminated and recognized. So you can see here, um, for some example gesture, like a finger wiggle, the range Doppler is time varying in a way where we can start to make out the reflections from two different fingers as they move in different directions or different velocities. So if they were still, let me play this we would only see one reflection which was stationary within the range and uh, velocity domains. But as they move with different velocities, they start to break apart in the velocity direction because one is moving with a speed towards the radar while one moves away from the radar. Similarly, you can see in the range uh, data waterfall, there's a characteristic motion pattern as things move up and down, as well as in the projection into the Doppler domain uh, where we can see signatures of things moving in opposite directions at the same time. So the range Doppler signal transformation produces very distinguishable patterns, um, which we see here can be used to discriminate four dynamic gestures across multiple users. And similarly, you can see these in the projections into the various dimensions, as I mentioned, for example, the microdoppler or the projection to the microdoppler space, um, which are shown here. So uh, we can immediately see or suggest to use machine learning in order to do a data-driven gesture classification based on these signal representations. And this is just a very, very early um, validation study that we did to validate the signal processing and sensing approach. Um, these were earlier results that we got with a random forest classifier, which achieved 92% accuracy on five users using half a million unsegmented data samples. Um, and I'll just mention that our current work explores um, newer models, including uh, various convolutional neural networks and other deep learning techniques, as well as focuses on scaling the data collection to support all the techniques needed for deep learning. And of course, we can combine all of the fine motion recognition that is achieved through this sensing paradigm with more classical range and angle estimates for 3D tracking and positioning of the hand. So at a very abstract level, what we're doing is taking a multi-dimensional cube of raw radar data, which varies as a function of the radar parameters. So the ADC samples, the chirps, um, the different Rx to Tx channels. And then we're transforming that raw data cube into new dimensions, which represent the gesture characteristics, the distance from the radar, the angular position, and the motion or velocity. And this transformation enables us to resolve the various scattering centers according to their, uh, according to their position and their motion. And it also provides the processing gain that's needed in order to achieve the required signal to noise ratio um, needed to detect these various scattering centers with low transmit power.
Um, I'll quickly mention that the solely sensing paradigm and signal representations are not just for very fine, small, near scale sensing for hands, um, but also scale to larger ranges. So uh, we can see that by adjusting the different transmission waveforms, we can do sensing at longer distances um, and more coarse or larger scale motions. Um, here you can see the range Doppler and the range over time um, changing as somebody walks across a room. And it's interesting because you can see the reflections from her various limbs moving with different velocities. So it's capturing a lot of subtle information about the way that she walks, her gait, and her movements um, as she moves across the room. Uh, we also did some very early visualizations of uh, exploring differentiation between things like humans and pets. And again, you can see in the range Doppler signal transformation, you can capture the different ways that the limbs move on a human versus an animal. So with a single sensor, we see that we can capture motion patterns on a variety of scales. Um, and at the larger scale, we can start to uh, discriminate things according to their presence, their activity, their gait, um, and achieve interactions on a variety of distances and scales. Um, I would like to mention briefly uh, the concept of hardware abstraction and how it relates to our recognition pipeline. Um, this was one of the core concepts that we started out with in the project. And the reason why it's uh, important is because we, early in the project, had not narrowed down our hardware to a specific architecture or modulation scheme. Um, and actually across the radar industry, there are many, many different types of radars all with uh, different architectures, different signals, um, different waveforms. And uh, to illustrate this, I'll just give a brief overview of the modulation schemes that we've used throughout our project. Um, I mentioned the frequency modulated continuous wave radar or FMCW architecture, which our current chip is based off of. Um, in this architecture, we send what's known as a chirp. So the frequency changes linearly over time of the transmission. Um, FMCW radars are nice because they have a very simple transceiver architecture, but on the con side, they also require highly linear frequency components like the PLL, VCO. Um, we had also used a DSSS discrete sequence spread spectrum radar, which I mentioned was built off a communications chip um, and employed a binary phase shift keying pseudo random sequence modulation scheme. So this was nice because it could share the architecture with the communication chip and it enabled very flexible coding schemes. But on the con side, the transceiver was slightly more complex than the FMCW. And this fairly, very earliest radar that I had mentioned, the five gigahertz impulse radar, works by sending extremely short duration impulses on the, on the order of a picosecond. This is nice because the transmitter is simple, but on the con side, it means you require an extremely fast ADC sampling rate which is not easy to achieve. So clearly the modulation and the hardware architecture um, design choices are driven by the intended application and the environment. Um, there are various requirements on the hardware complexity, the resistance to different types of interference, the power efficiency. And for radar to be a truly scalable consumer technology, we thought it would be important to support all these flavors of hardware without major changes to the software pi uh, processing pipeline. You can compare this to a, a camera analogy where you can apply the same image recognition algorithms, whether the original image itself came from a DSLR, a cell phone, um, a scanned film image. So the quality of the results of the image recognition pipeline might vary, but the underlying algos are consistent. You don't need to redesign the algo every time you change the underlying camera hardware. So for Project Sully, we designed the signal representation so that they could be computed for any periodically modulated coherent radar. And that means that they can form a sort of radar hardware abstraction layer, which would be agnostic to the specifics of the architecture and the modulation scheme. And that meant that we could interchange the different radar hardwares that we were working with, depending on the intended application and environments, and the software pipeline would stay consistent. This is nice because it also opens up the playing field to many different radar vendors 
um, enabling us to consider on a per product or per application basis, which would be most suitable. And so just as an illustration of the success, we've run the exact same gesture recognition software successfully on all of the hardware implementations that we considered in our project, including both the FMCW and the BPSK chips, as well as the very earliest five gigahertz impulse reader. So now we've seen that the sensing approach that we implemented for Sully is capable of detecting and tracking extremely fine finger and hand motions. Um, so the question was, how do we translate this into a gesture interaction language? Here I'll show a couple early demos, which we use to explore how to leverage the radar's fidelity and precision. So in this demo, we tracked millimeter scale finger displacements, and then we mapped those displacements to visual elements. So you can immediately see how responsive and sensitive the five millimeter wavelength radar is to the finger motions. In this next demo, we interpreted the finger motions into gestures using simple machine learning. So using this uh, click gesture with your fingers, you can scroll through a menu, both forward as well as backwards. And because radar offers so many uh, different sensing capabilities, we can build very rich multi-dimensional user interfaces. So here we built multiple controls in space by combining the ranging capability with fine motion recognition. So when you're close to the radar, you can control one set of controls and then the minutes control is controlled by uh, moving your hand farther away from the radar, but utilizing the same gesture. And then of course, radar can be used for more than just precision gesture control. Um, we can use it to build very playful interfaces and games, um, like you can see here. So the question was, how do we use these sensing capabilities to build a gesture interaction language for products, where the intent of the gestures are easy to understand and to communicate to the user? And the core UX design idea here was that the motions that we use to interact with devices have become very intuitive in our modern day life. So if you take, for example, a touch screen, even when you remove the physical phone, the intent of this action is very understandable and intuitive. And similarly, um, we can apply this concept to many different physical controls and interfaces. So for all of these controls, the essence of the interaction with them lies in the motion that you use to control them. So we can start to relate dynamic gestures to very familiar tool interactions, including things like a dial or a slider or a button. So in this virtual tools concept, uh, the hand is both embodying as well as acting upon the tool. And even though the controls don't exist physically, they're very intuitive and easy to understand. And a natural byproduct of these gestures is that you have the haptic feedback of the fingers moving against each other or against the other parts of the hand. So we can see that this gesture language based on virtual tools leverages the capabilities of millimeter wave radar sensing to build touchless interfaces anywhere in space. So the combination of hardware, software, and algorithmic developments that we worked on in Sully made it possible to build several novel concept products early in the project. Um, for the first time, we embedded radar into a smartphone, or excuse me, a smartwatch in collaboration with LG. And here the ranging capability of radar was used to progressively reveal information in the user, in the user interface. Um, and then when you're in an interaction zone, the virtual dial and the button could be used to control the menu. We additionally built a speaker in, in collaboration with Harman. So here you can see that the light feedback is mapped to the distance as the user guides their hand into the interaction space. Um, and then you can use the same gestures, uh, the dial or the slider in order to control the music. 
Okay, so I'll talk a little bit about how we went from those concept products into the use cases for the Pixel 4. So the concept products that I mentioned before showed the potential for radar to expand the interaction zone with devices from a 2D touchscreen to the whole 3D space around the device. And this means that we can start to have the device perceive what's going on around it and incorporate that into the user interaction. So by combining sensing with machine learning and machine intelligence, we can augment very familiar explicit interactions like touch gestures or key presses with the implicit communication cues in 3D space that radar allows. So for example, body language or proxemics. So here radar can open up the possibility to create new and fluid interfaces with intelligent devices. In the Pixel 4, we focused on three key interaction states. The first is awareness. So Soli can be aware of the user's presence around it. Next was engagement. So Soli can recognize body cues that are intended to start interactions like reaching for the device. And finally, an active state where Soli can respond to gestures like swiping in order to perform specific tasks. So from these three interaction states, we built use cases um, to enable the, the device to uh, interact with the user. So the solely present sensing was used to control the always on display as one use case. The AOD turns on when the user is detected within a certain range of the phone. And then when solely senses that the user is far from the phone, that nobody is near, um, the AOD shuts off, which allows the phone to conserve battery. When Soli detects that the user is reaching for the phone, it can actually use this gesture in order to prime the cameras for face unlock. So it gets the cameras ready to perform the face authentication. And this accelerates the overall authentication experience. It also uses this reach gesture to change the AOD display, which allows the phone to feel more responsive and in tune with the user. Um, uh, in terms of the explicit gestures, Soli can allow the user to dismiss an alarm with a wave. And when an incoming call happens at um, an inconvenient time, the user can quiet this ring by reaching for the phone and then dismissing it with a swipe. And lastly, Soli can recognize a user swiping forward and backward in order to touchlessly navigate through music. So all of these touchless interactions, which are enabled by Soli, make it easier and quicker for users to perform common tasks on their phone and to do so while staying engaged with the real world around them. Um, Soli allows them to control the phone without needing to navigate through touch menus. Um, you don't need a lot of hand-eye coordination to perform these tasks, and you don't need to turn your attention all the way away from what you are doing. So you can see how this concept extends to many other contexts like driving a car where you don't want to take your eyes off the road um, or environments where you don't want to touch a screen or an interface due to hygienic reasons. Um, and I think that's becoming increasingly relevant in this COVID world that we live in now. Finally, I'll highlight some of the interesting um, engineering challenges that we tackled in order to integrate the Sully radar into the Pixel 4 smartphone. So first I'll mention the location of the RFIC in the phone. Of course, one of the advantages of millimeter wave radar is that the sensor can be embedded invisibly into the bezel. So it's located um, on the upper bezel underneath the glass. And we actually spent a lot of effort in optimizing the antennas and the materials above the radar due to uh, millimeter wave sensitivity to various materials. Um, so this graph on the left shows the radar signal loss as a function of different frequencies and for different air gap distances between the receiver and the glass front cover. You can see there's a lot of variation depending both on distance as well as frequency. Um, we had to deal with different losses of the signal due to the glass and the plastic enclosure around the phone. Um, obviously, we had to avoid metal above the sensor, but beyond that, there was a lot of optimization of the specific materials that we placed in the vertical stack above the sensor. So this final design has a stack of plastic, 
glass as well as two different adhesives and we had to carefully design the thicknesses as well as the placements of all of these different materials. Um, I mentioned in the use cases that we did a lot of sensing based on the presence of the user. And in that case, we were concerned about the whole hemisphere of sensing. So we wanted the sensing to be agnostic to the direction from which the user approached. And that meant we had to optimize the physical design and the integration of the phone in order to achieve sufficient SNR, not only at the bore site, so straight ahead of the radar, but also over a very wide field of view, so in the side lobes as well. Um, as part of the study, we found that the side lobe energy could be affected by the thickness and the choice of the adhesive that I had mentioned before. And so we spent some effort um, in optimizing those two parameters. So this graph shows how the SNR, the signal to noise ratio of the radar looks across 120 degrees, um, all three receivers and 54 phones. And you can see that there's some variation um, by device and by, uh, by receiver, by angle. Um, but it more or less provides sufficient SNR across 120 degrees in order to do detection. Um, our, our algorithms were designed to accommodate the unit to unit variation that we see, especially at the side lobes. Uh, another area of effort that we spent a great deal of time on was in ensuring signal integrity. This was important because uh, we wanted to prevent interference and false targets that could arise from different surrounding phone components and different operating conditions. Um, I'll just call out an early example that we encountered when we were, we were working with uh, the phone prototype. So this was before the commercially released phone came out. Um, there was an artifact called the, which we call the random phase element, which produced a, a false target at a very specific range. And we traced this, um, this issue to a noise injection on the power line. So it showed the sensitivity of our sensor to the cleanliness of the electrical signals around it. And we actually spent some time developing a hardware solution in order to filter this false target out from the radar signal. Um, another interesting artifact that we encountered was in audio interference. So obviously slowly as a radar, it's very sensitive to motion. So it actually started picking up audio vibrations of the phone when music was playing. Um, we developed a custom Soli filter in DSP, uh, which was intended to reduce the impact of the vibration and thus allow gesture detection to work while music was playing, which obviously was very important for our music swiping use case. And finally, we had to address the robustness of the gesture recognition algorithms to an extremely wide variety of user behaviors around the device. Um, users perform different gestures, even very simple ones in many different ways. And in addition to that, there are a lot of extraneous motions that could occur within the range of the phone that might look like the gestures we're trying to detect. So the ML models were actually trained with millions of gestures recorded from um, thousands, on the order of thousands of Google volunteers. And the radar recordings were mixed with many hours of background radar recordings from other volunteers, uh, which contained generic motions without the target gestures made near the device, some of which are shown here. So moving objects over the radar, um, touching the touch screen, swiping over the touch screen, moving your hand near the device. Um, these encapsulated some of the negative samples that we captured. And so the culmination of all these efforts was solely shipping in the Pixel 4. Um, as I mentioned at the start of the talk, this introduced radar as a new sensing technology for many different classes of human uh, of devices um, and new interfaces for human machine um, interaction. And so we're excited that this might represent the cusp of a large emergence of radar into a variety of consumer applications um, by combining the technical advances with creative design we hope to see radar in a wide variety of places to come. I think I will end there and I'd be happy to take any questions. Thank you very much, um, Jamie, for the presentation. So yeah, we're now open to questions and uh, we do have quite a lot of people here. So just to avoid it being chaotic, um, if there are any questions, just raise your hands on the participant list and I will um, unmute you. You can ask a question. Otherwise, you could type it down on chat. I'll read it out um, for Jamie to answer it as well. So yeah, um, are there any questions for anyone? 
I think there should be because there are a couple of people here actually working on the sensor itself. So now it's a good time to ask Jamie about the um, the sensor itself. Actually, do you have any um, any questions so far? Maybe I'll, I'll kick things off with the questions from my side first. Um, so Jamie, you showed you showed that like during the early thirties and forties. Um, Radar, needless to say, it's pretty huge. It's pretty big. Even even during the um, early development of the current Soli, it was like a desktop size, roughly. Um, so I was just wondering, like prior to maybe like 2014, 2015, um, from your research that you've done while developing Soli, what was the like closest competing product to Soli? Like I, I'm pretty sure that, or uh, to my knowledge, the Soli was one of the first um, deployed consumer radar on mobile phones, but there should be a couple of sort of really small size radars or here and there, like for maybe for developers and things like this. So could you share with us some of the things that you found that's really close to Soli and like maybe what key differences or how did it inspire the design for Soli? Do you mean other sensing modalities or um, other radar? Other other radars available around other, other radar architectures that may or may not be consumer ready. Um, but I think, I, I think there should be some consumer ready radars. Maybe you could share some of this with us. Yeah, I think um, there were industrial applications for radar uh, and vehicle applications for radar ahead of Project Soli. Um, just off the top of my head, like self-driving cars, a lot of them rely on 77 gigahertz radar. Um, there were two bands that they were that they were considering uh, when Project Soli started. There was 24 gigahertz and 77, and so. Um, I think the main limitation of the vehicular radar there is that uh, they follow a, a sensing paradigm similar to the traditional approach that I've mentioned. So they rely on much larger antenna arrays. And so the form factor of these radars wasn't necessarily conducive to consumer sensing for human machine interaction. Um, in addition to that, the very first dev kit that we got um, was this ultra wideband radar that I mentioned in the talk. And that had been around for a couple of years, I think, um, when we started the project. Um, and the limitation there, again, as I, as I mentioned, was that the frequency was a little too low to be feasible for antennas to actually fit into wearables or smartphone. Um, so I, I think uh, like there was a lot of, of research radar and a lot maybe not a lot, but there was some commercial off the shelf radar, which was targeted at um, not necessarily HCI, but certainly hobbyist radar uh, people and other people exploring radar in a more uh, commercial, I think, uh, environment. Um, but because first there wasn't necessarily a single RFIC implementation and second that the wavelengths were a little too large, to be feasible for integration into small devices, it didn't. It hadn't yet caught on as a consumer sensor. Great. Uh, we have a question by uh, Tharindu. So, could you please unmute and proceed with the question? Yeah, hi. Uh, uh, I was going to ask what uh, what made you not include those uh, micro gestures like uh, you showed on the smartwatches that uh, used to like change the time and stuff into the pixel. Uh, yeah, there's a couple different um, aspects to the answer of that. Uh, the first was that there wasn't actually um, a large amount of interest from the product side for the specific products that we were looking at. Um, we focused pretty much exclusively on the Pixel after the first concept products came out. And the feedback from the product management was that users would be more likely uh, to use more understandable and perhaps more familiar large scale gestures like swiping. And the second part was that um, the fine gestures that I showed are actually, uh, they're, they're a little harder to make robust compared to these larger scale swipes and reaching. And so as a first initial product to put Sully in, um, we thought it would be important to achieve uh, robustness and accuracy that could demonstrate a path towards future gestures and future applications, um, rather than immediately trying to border the ocean <laughs> and uh, maybe delivering less than than stellar results. Um, our next question is from Gun. 
Great, thanks. Um, thanks, Jamie, for the great talk. Um, I think it's very interesting. It's been um, interesting to look at technology get into the consumer um, phone, and that's a very great um, advance. Um, I would love to ask um, how forgiving is the technology in terms of wearing things, such as um, if you are wearing a ski glove on the ski field or, or um, wearing a glove in the winter time. It's I think it's very common. Um, I was wondering how forgiving is the technology when having other things on your hands. And also um, wanted to ask if you had uh, been looking into other body parts such as um, elbows or, or other feet or other body parts um, used for interaction with the device. Uh, yeah, so the first question, how forgiving it is, is it to things on your hands or body? Um, very forgiving. So radar is transparent to fabrics um, as well as to a certain extent, plastics, um, almost, I think every conceivable material that you might put around your hand, except for metal. So things like clothing, this was actually one of the big um, advantages of using radar was that it wouldn't be affected if you were wearing a glove or um, I don't know, through a blanket radar can see, so you can have various applications that uh, where visually you wouldn't be able to see something, but radar could penetrate through. Um, so I think that that was one of the, the main features of the radar um, as we were exploring use cases. And the second question, can you, oh, other body parts. Uh, other body yeah. parts like using face waving or. Um... Yeah, we're, we're definitely interested and we have we have looked at this. Um, I'll just mention back to the talk that we looked at this room scale sensing, where it was very clear from the range Doppler signal transformation that the reflection from various body parts like the different limbs and the head are easily captured and distinguishable within that signal representation. And so um, I think it's not so much a question of sensing capability, like we know we're, we know that the Sully sensor is capable of capturing these signals and um, leveraging them. So the question is more from the UX side, what would we actually do with that? And I think that's still um, open question with a lot of interesting possible directions. Great. Thank you. Um, we have a question by Tamil actually. So Tamil, can you proceed with your question first? Hi, Jamie. Uh, my, uh, I have a doubt on uh, when you tried solely in smartwatches, especially when you collaborated with LG, what are the difficulties you, uh, uh, that projects face in terms of human uh, uh, interaction on smartwatches? Yeah, I can speak to some of the engineering challenges. Um, we actually did that concept product very, very early in our project. And um, even just getting all of the, the hardware to get down to the size where it was feasible to put it into the smartwatch, I think was a great challenge. Um, there was also an interesting challenge that stood out to me at that point of the project was that one of the main um, difficulties that we had was that the sensor became very, very hot. And of course, when you're wearing the smartwatch, you don't want to have um, a sensor burning through the watch against your skin. And so I think this uh, really um, emphasized to me the importance of power management and power efficiency when it came to sensing for human machine interactions and wearables, um, and how that came into play in driving down the power consumption for future use cases. Um, I think from the UX standpoint, I'm, I'm probably not the best person to speak to this, but um, uh, I, I think the location of the smartwatch and where the sensor would be within the watch is, is interesting from the radar perspective, um, particularly because with the radar antennas, typically what you want to do is, um, well, typically the way that the radar is architected is so that you transmit most of your energy at foresight, so perpendicular to the plane of the sensor. And so this presents an immediate, um, not insurmountable, but maybe not ideal uh, orientation for smartwatch sensing if you wanted to do a one-handed gesture. So if you wear the smartwatch and also use the gesture on the hand that the smartwatch is on. Um, so that's just one of the US considerations that I think um, would present an interesting design challenge, both from the technical and work standpoint. Thanks, Jamie. That 
All right. Um, our next question is by Ali Reza. Hi. Thanks, Jamie. It was really great, great presentation. Actually, my question lies in the program part mostly. So um, just quick questions. Um, what I first question of mine is about what kind of other representations did you explore other than microdoppler and the you know others that you mentioned earlier to reach your final representations, um, which is suitable for your machine learning algorithms that you used for. We looked into a lot. I think there was a lot of interest from the machine learning side of the team um, to put the raw radar signal into the machine learning algorithms. And I think that's like a, a natural thing to ask is whether the machine can learn to do this recognition directly from the raw signal. Um, and they did actually achieve uh, some promising results. I think um, like the decision to not use the raw radar signal has to do first with this abstraction layer that I mentioned, because different architectures and different modulation schemes for radar would produce different formats of raw signal. And so having a common format, a common representation to be fed into the machine learning meant that we could switch out the different modulations and different architectures of the hardware without affecting the machine learning model that had them later in the pipeline. Um, in addition to that, I think there were various questions of how processed do we want the signal to be before it goes into the machine learning algorithm. And this especially came up when it came to angular sensing. Um, there are a number of signal processing techniques that you can use uh, to more classically pull out different angular positions. Um, I'll just mention things like beamforming or interferometry are two techniques which have been used in the past in more classical radar uh, literature and research. Um, and so I think uh, without perhaps revealing ongoing research, uh, that was one of the questions is, do we want to actually use those techniques and pre-process the signal to extract those information? Or is it sufficient to put in the information pre-computation, pre-signal processing into the machine learning and have it uh, learn itself where the angles were? Um, thanks. Another question of mine is about, um, did you use a uh, multimodal input for your algorithms? For example, uh, you are using radar to um, track the gestures. So why you are not using, for example, voice, in including with, for example, um, sensing the um, hand gesture and stuff. So I think then you don't need too much you know, accurate uh, algorithm to in, in the phone or whatever application it has. So you can easily detect the hand and you know the, it would be so much you know, uh, accurate. Yeah, I think multimodal is a great point. And I think it's an ongoing area of research um, across multiple groups. Um, certainly, I think solely as the radar can complement a lot of different existing sensors and different sensors can complement solely. Um, so I think there's a lot of room to explore there. Uh, I'll just mention that in the Pixel 4, we we did some very high level combination of IMU data with Soli, um, not at the lower level. So I don't know that I would call it true sensor fusion, but we did look into how information from one sensor might be able to either gate or make more robust the information from others. Thank you. Thanks. So we have um, some questions on the chat. And the first one is from Yo, which is actually similar with what I had in mind, actually. Um, is there any new developer kit coming soon? And will there be any access to more low level data on the Pixel 4? Because as I understand, there's currently the Soli sandbox for users to play around with, but that's sort of like a post classified, um, classified um, like presence and tap and gestures, but it's not exactly raw signals. So do you have any thoughts you could share on that? Uh, this has been a debate for a long time, I think. And I think from the team, I mean, we we love to see what people can build from the radar data. And so um, we would like eventually to have the radar data exposed, but I think there's a number of different considerations at the product level and the organization, the company level, which, um, some of which are beyond our control. So as of right now, there are no, no concrete plans for that. Um, developer kit, we've 
The short answer is I'm not sure. I, it's an uh, idea that we've been exploring and I think hasn't been fully fleshed out yet at this point. So um, we'll see. I think this leads us to the second question, and this is from Thurindu, which is um, what is the current status of the future of Soli? Um, because as we, as some of us may know, the recently released Pixel 5 device does not have it. And I think Pixel 4 has been discontinued already, if I'm not mistaken. So will we, or you know, as much as you could share with us, do you think, will it this be in future mobile phones or will it be likely embedded into other devices like the Nest Home that you showed earlier, or maybe the smartwatch, the LG smartwatch, anything like this you can share with us? Yeah, so Solvi actually was inside the Nest thermostat that came out last year. Um, they use it for presence sensing, replacing an IR sensor, and this allowed the uh, PD to be the seamless glass display, which as a radar engineer, <laughs> I think is great, but I think from a PD standpoint was amazing that they could make this seamless display. So uh, Soli is going into, has gone into a, a another product other than Pixel. Um, I can't disclose more, I think, without risking my job, <laughs> but uh, we are optimistic about Zoli going into a variety of devices in the future. That's good to hear. I'm, I'm so looking forward to it. I personally am also using the Pixel 4, so I've been playing around with it myself, and uh, there's a lot of things that can be done with it. Um, so looking forward to some of the future products. Um, yeah, so we have a question by Ishan actually. Ishan, do you want to directly, directly ask a question? Um, yes. Yeah. Uh, uh, thank you so much. Um, sorry, I don't know my video is not sorry. I'm just wondering um, about the commercial side and how would you um, think that um, about the commercializations of this product, let's say when it's ready for um, you know, people out there uh, what type of market that you think is going to be targeted first for you know using this solely as like making it as a common tool later on or you know many people can take the benefit of this I'm just wondering from the the business side or you know marketing side yeah I I mean I'm sure the business people would say they hope everyone is the target audience I think <laughs> by introducing I, I think the goal um, was is to make this ubiquitous. And so the more common everyday objects that can be made intelligent with these types of sensors, the more people we would reach and, and who would use this technology. And so I think as 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 sensors like Sully become integrated, not just into smartphones and um, thermostats, but also maybe into like the everyday environment around you into your toaster oven or, um, your light bulb. I think it it expands the potential customer base, um, and and also makes the the gesture language more ubiquitous and easily adopted. So, I think it's I think the vision, at least, is to have this be easily integrable into a number of everyday objects and environments and thus not target specifically for say early technology adopters or a specific type of person but rather have it be seamlessly integrated into the world around you uh, do you have any specific like a plan where like when so it's going to be like commercialized or something just I'm just wondering do you mean as a standalone sensor yeah something like this um so, so solely would well, I can't speak to to business plans, but thus far we've focused on solely being a component of different products, and so um, our our working model up to now has been to work with different um, product groups like the Pixel and the Nest team in order to put solely in there and not necessarily sell it as a standalone sensor. Mm -hmm. So the avenue I think towards commercialization was through the different products that we integrated solely into. All right. Thank you, Jimmy. Thank you. OK, so our next question is by Zoe, uh, which is quite relatable with Ishan's question, actually. So in an accessibility point of view, um, how is this? How do you think the sensor can be used for users who are differently abled? 
or um, if there are ways to customize it for those who are, for example, have vision difficulties or like missing limbs, how does this impact the use of Soli um, overall? Yeah, I think I think there's two aspects to that question. First, how Soli can help to enable people um, who might be on different sides of the accessibility spectrum. And I, I definitely think that Soli, by offering complementary sensing properties to say, cameras or voice activated controls um, can help to enable these different classes, not classes, these different um, people with different accessibility constraints. Uh, so as one example, um, Soli can detect different obstacles and different materials and objects around the person. And so you can envision potentially someone who was vision impaired, maybe using the radar to enable them to prevent from walking into things that they can't visually see. Um, similarly, people who might not have, who might be speech impaired um, through touchless controls and motion um, might be able to control devices that they wouldn't otherwise be able to control. And then I think there's a question on the opposite side of whether if we enable these types of motion-based controls, are there people who might be disadvantaged from that type of modality? And I think that's something that we have to keep in mind that not everybody, for example, um, is able to easily move their hands and limbs in a certain way. And so the design of gestures needs to take that into account and make sure that they're as easy to use as possible for as wide a segment of the population as they can. Our um, next question is by Rio. Um, maybe Nasaran's question first. Oh, well, I'm doing it sequentially. So I see that your, your hands are raised before the question's okay. time. So maybe you can proceed first. Cool. Okay. Thank you, Jamie, for the talk. I it was kind of happy to see some behind the scene um, videos, especially I like the dog one. Um, so my question is from more like kind of designing sensor part. So I was just wondering, so it's kind of nature of those current I mean, modern devices that those uh, footprint of the device getting smaller, smaller. But then I'm just wondering, what if we make the Soli sensor into bigger scale, like like let's say the like room scale or like room wall scale, for example, like placing multiple antennas on the wall in the room, and or maybe designing the some sort of like spherical receiving antennas that having the multiple antennas installed to the spherical surface with one single TX antenna would, and my question is, would we see some kind of different signal or um, how can I say, like like something interesting results out, out from that? Yeah, I think that's a great question and it's really interesting. Like we, we spend so much effort in shrinking things down, but there's also this wide open space of research if we expand <laughs> things. Um, and definitely uh, just from a theoretical perspective, the spatial resolution and particularly the angular resolution you could achieve if that were the case would be much, much finer than what we can achieve now. So I think um, just to name one example, things like a finer grained imaging, so a, a radar imager um, producing images of people or things at radio frequencies would be interesting to explore and might be possible if you had larger arrays like that. Um, in addition, the coverage issue becomes uh, much, much easier just in terms of having signal propagate to a very, very wide area um, becomes much easier the more chips or the more antennas that you have. Um, so for sure, I think the, the granularity of the um, spatial data that you get would be finer. And I think that would enable um, large number of use cases, maybe complementary to the motion-based sensing that we have now. Mm -hmm. And then, yeah, I'm, actually I was wondering that because I saw the video during your presentation, like multiple uh, antennas are placed, which is like like um, separated antennas are placed underneath the fingers to measure the finer motion. Like, And then I was just wondering like, how the accuracy of the, of the sensing different between that setup and also the current consumer device, consumer solely. Yeah. So in that video, that was actually the antennas for the five gigahertz radar that we were using. 
That's why they were much bigger and spaced further apart. Um, and because we had already decided by then to use this motion-based sensing approach, there wasn't actually much difference in the motion sensitivity and the motion resolution that we were achieving. So we didn't, we didn't look fully into doing this um, angular spatial sensing with that radar setup because we had already decided that the sensitivity and the strength of radar was in the motion-based sensing. So um, I think the short answer to your question is that large antenna video produced much the same signal quality and signal representation that we achieved even with the single RFIC. Interesting, thank you. Thanks. Um, our next question is by Nastaran. Um, and she asked, is there any research on detecting facial expressions or facial component movements by Soli? So maybe it could be worked on by Google or maybe there are like research papers out there that use this sensor for, for this purpose? Um, there's definitely existing work on, on vital sign sensing. Uh, I'm not sure off the top of my head if they've focused specifically on facial motions, but um, I will <laughs> point out that Danielle has suggested this herself, and I think raised a lot of interesting possibilities about using radar for detecting small um, muscular or other types of movements in the face. So, so uh, it's definitely an interesting research question. I'm just not sure whether it's already been done before. Our next question is by um, Roger. Um, yeah. hey, I just wanted to follow up with a question that Rio asked. Uh, sorry, Roger, it's a little bit soft. Could you maybe either increase the volume or maybe closer to the microphone? Hello, hello. Is it better now? Well, just a little bit soft, but I can hear it. Hopefully, um, Jamie, you could hear it too. OK, yeah, yeah. I, I, w I just wanted to follow up with um, the question that Rio made. And I wanted to ask, like, if the location of the antennas has a really high impact on the um, resolution that you can extract and you control the product, how come you decided, for example, for the Pixel 4 to embed it everything in one single chip rather than um, placing the antennas in a, like a strategic location? Yeah, so this gets down uh, into the, the technique well, the basis, the fundamentals of angular positioning with radar. So the angular resolution is tied to the antenna aperture or the antenna array aperture dimensions. So as the aperture becomes larger and larger, you can achieve finer resolution. The difference is that uh, if you move them too far apart, you actually introduce ambiguity. So you can think of the antenna placement as a sampling rate in space. And so you have to achieve a certain Nyquist criteria uh, with how far apart these different antenna elements are placed to prevent aliasing, which basically means an ambiguity that you can't resolve where exactly the thing is. Um, and so for five millimeter wavelengths, uh, in general, you want to place the antennas at half of the wavelength apart, which means that for five millimeters, you wanna put them about 2.5 millimeters apart. As you move them farther and farther, um, this phase-based angular positioning, so techniques like beamform or, or interferometry that um, become ambiguous. They introduce the ambiguities that I mentioned before. So you would have to rely on a technique like triangulation, which means rather than relying on the phase differences at the different channels, you rely on the time of arrival and differences in the time of arrival. And that's actually much coarser than the phase delta between different channels. So. At a less technical high level, um, you can move them farther apart, but that doesn't actually increase the accuracy of the angular positioning if they're just two elements far apart rather than filled in with elements in between. Got it. Yep. Does that make sense? Yeah, it does make total sense. Okay. And a second question will be like, the, um, you also show that how you train all the different gestures with um, Pixel, with you, you mentioned like a almost like thousands or millions of gestures from different volunteers. I was wondering, like, do you think like the same data set will be valid for other products as well? For other what? For other products, like if you um, embed it in, in other devices like the speaker or the smartwatch, et cetera, do you think like the same data set that you collected will be usable 
I don't think it would be usable by itself. I think at the very least, it would have to be augmented. And the reason why is because I think the way that users perform a gesture can vary from based on the type of device that it is. Not only um, like the mental model of how they're using the device, but also just from a radar technology standpoint, the positioning of the hand relative to the radar would probably vary whether it was in the smartwatch or a smartphone or some other some other device. And so I think if 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 the sensor were moved to a different product and potentially different location within the product, um, at least, at the very least, the data set would need to be augmented with actual collections based on the actual product and not just moving over the data set from the pixel collection. Thanks. So I think that's all the um, questions we have for now. Um, so this should bring us to the end of the seminar. Thank you once again, Jamie, for sharing your work, as well as everyone here um, attended attending this meeting, some of them really early, actually, in the morning. So thank you very much for joining us. Um, so just keep an eye on our next seminar, which should be probably within two weeks. We'll have it posted on the, on the group, um, on the Facebook page for ECL Lab. So thank you, everyone, for joining us. Have a good day or evening, depending on where you are. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Bye. See you. Bye. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks, Jimmy. Thanks, bye. Thank you.